Stand by for the 155th different variation on this enduring theme. Never two the same. The Blues are away. Very poor start from Cambridge there. Rebecca just stuck her hand up to say she wasn't ready, literally as the umpire was saying goes. So problems on Cambridge on the stroke side means they didn't quite go off straight. So now they must find full throttle as they reach out over these first fuel thirsty yards simply for momentum, converting months of stockpiled energy and fitness and technique into efficient boat movement, competing for rhythm now and for the right to be first to occupy the stream. It is a scrap for the early initiative. The first few minutes here are very important. Oxford, a very strong crew. We'd expect them to be fast off the start. And remember, in a few minutes' time, they have the advantage of the first bend. Very important for Cambridge to stay in this right now. Because of the problems Cambridge had off the start, Oxford got about half a length in the first five, six strokes. But Cambridge have settled a little bit better and are starting to peg Oxford back. And I think now the crews are coming back to level and they're being warned by the umpire for the first time. Let's get down and hear from the Oxford Crocs, Colin Groshaw. Urging them on, rhythm, boat movement, boat position now key as the Coxes assimilate each other's early movements. Warnings from the umpire. Yeah, they're getting a bit close to each other. And what's very interesting is that Cambridge have pulled back and they're rowing at a much lower rate. They're cruising along. It's going to be very interesting to see if they can keep pulling ahead here. Oxford Cox was calling for more length. Yeah, we've had that first minute where the stroke rates are high, they're getting lots of strokes in, and now they're looking for the length and rhythm, which is going to carry them over the next 17 minutes of this race. I would say it's Cambridge at the moment that have settled a bit better, and Oxford, yeah, they're powerful, but they're slightly misfiring. Oxford have the first bend, Cambridge have the lead. Into their boat and Rebecca Dalbiggin. First major bend is immediately upon us as the Fulham Wall swings round towards Craven Cottage. It is a bend that is kind to Oxford on the Middlesex side. The owners very much on them to lead out of it if they can, because if Cambridge hold on, or better, from the initially disadvantaged Surrey side, then they are very well positioned to cash in on the big bend which comes up after Hammersmith Bridge. Yes, the next minute and a half is all about Oxford, how much of the inside of the bend can they take advantage of. Rebecca Dow big in there was saying that she feels she's pushed Oxford over quite a long way, she was comfy with her, her position on the river, and I think I agree, at the moment Oxford are a long way over to the Middlesex station, and Cambridge are actually dominating the middle of the river. Most recent warning was for Cambridge, there hasn't been a clash of oars, they're comfortably apart now. No danger of a clash at the moment. Cambridge have kept in this, Oxford have taken their third of a length advantage from the first bend. Now, what's going to happen from now to Hammersmith? Can Cambridge stay in it and then take advantage of their bend? As the stern pair, Kishorin and Bridgewater, vast and rhythmic, the pair of them so important to Oxford, who uh, have, what, a quarter of a length advantage at this stage? as gradually the unrealistically high early stroke rates give way to manageable race pace. Past the Black Boy, Beverly Brook, Barn Elms on the Surrey side, that is the south bank of the river. And past also the first of the iconic landmarks on the Middlesex side, up to the mile post, for which the record is uh, just over three and a half minutes. It is uh, a pretty quick race. It's good conditions, it's good rowing, it's, it's, it's fast, it's good. And to me at the moment, star performer is Rebecca Dalbig, and she's dominated the Oxford boat. She's actually pushed them over the river, she's kind of used her bend, her experience very well now. The Oxford advantage of the first bend is over, it's now going to start to swing around in Cambridge's favour, and the umpire is starting to get get annoyed with the crews, yeah, because they're going to have to come apart. He is really keen for them to get apart. They are close to each other, and James Cracknell is close to them both. James. Yeah, it's a fantastic race developing down here. You can see why the Cambridge Stroke Man had a golden ticket. He's rowing incredibly long and giving the big guys in the middle of the boat a chance to, chance to get that work rate down. Oxford, they're not looking that clean, but they're starting to develop a bit more of a solid rhythm, which they didn't have in sort of minutes two, three and four. This next sort of three or four minutes is going to be really key, and Cambridge half to take control. Boris Rankov, the umpire, more involved than he would want to be. The boat race in recent years has been remarkably clean, 
It's five years now since the last notable clash at around about this point in the river 2004. More than the first mile gone, a point at which to calculate. Wait. We've just seen a straight stretch of rowing where we got a, got a good sense of which crew is the faster, and you saw Cambridge came from about half a length down to level, maybe even just leading a bit. And that's exactly what they needed to do before their bend comes into play. By Harrods Depository, they have rowed a regular 2K race and more. That would be it for most competitive oarsmen. It is barely a quarter of the challenge for these guys. Still three miles left, and this now is a most important stretch of straight in the contest. A long trap tree reach where position ahead of Hammersmith Bridge becomes key. Look how close they are. To achieve a clear water lead before the pivotal point is utopian for either side. To be best placed to maximise the long pronounced Surrey bend which follows it is the core requirement now. Taking stock, making the call. This is where a Cox can earn his or her call. A point in the race for speed balanced by tactical nuance. Factors, your boat position, the stream, the Surrey shore, the opposing boat position, the proximity of the bend. Yeah, we've got a position now where Oxford are on the defensive. They've had to put in a push. They're pushing hard now, trying to get that distance back on Cambridge, because at the moment I'm very impressed with Cambridge. They've got the length, they've got the rhythm, they've got a Cox that's dominating the steering, and Oxford are having to be aggressive. We thought it would have to be the other way around, maybe. We thought it was Cambridge who would have to be aggressive, but at the moment it's Oxford who are really tucking in there under that lamppost, trying to upset the Cambridge rhythm. The underdogs lead at Hammersmith Bridge against their bend. What follows now favours Cambridge. 80% of leaders here do go on to win the race. It is a trend that has been uh, frequently challenged of late last year. Cambridge, having clawed back from their initial deficit, did lead narrowly at Hammersmith Bridge. Oxford went on to win. Cambridge lead at Hammersmith again, with the bend now in their favour. It's very, very close to clashing. If one of these oars hits the other, then we could say we could see a sort of boat defy or a race defining moment here. Because yeah, the, the two man's blade of Oxford is very close to the seven man's blade of Cambridge. And yeah, if they clash, we could get an incident. Cambridge have done incredibly well here. Rebecca Dowbing and now on the bow man of Oxford. They still have four or five minutes of bend in their favour. This could be the beginning of an historic upset. Competition for position is fractious here. There is only one ideal line. In fact, in the uh, Cambridge Trial H race back in uh, December, there was a clash this deep into the contest, which uh, would, in a genuine race situation, have led to a disqualification. But now the sharp Surrey Bend kicks in bringing with it a, a sometimes telling change in relative wind direction, a potentially disruptive change in conditions, but conditions on what amounts to a mill pond ought not to be too much of a factor this year. Every card is now stacked in favour of the Surrey side which uh, often contrarily acts as an impetus to those on the outside of the bend. Yeah, Oxford are pushing hard, they're not letting Cambridge have the water, they're fighting back, maybe starting to inch back again. Rebecca is trying to hold the line, hold Oxford wide and then cut in sharp, because, yeah, Cambridge will have the advantage for the next two minutes, but as we can see there, big clash. It's going to upset the rhythm, it's going to upset the boat, and they're going to have to get clear, because otherwise we're not going to get a rowing race, we're just going to get a, going to get a fight. Or meets or as Cambridge try to pull away, as Oxford try to hang on round this long, long Surrey bend. Let's get down and hear again from Colin Groshong in the Oxford boat. He is imploring them and they are responding. Oxford, I think, have recovered a seat or two here, and we have a wonderful race, a wonderful race around past St Paul's School and the beers and the cheers of that delicious row of Hammersmith pubs. They reach the two-mile mark and beyond, and up coming next to Chiswick Gate. Oxford have seen the danger, they've responded. You heard Colin Groshon calling for a major push. Their stroke rate went up to 38, 39 strokes per minute, while Cambridge was sagging down on 34, 33 now. We may have seen Cambridge's best effort already. Let's get into the Cambridge boat now and see how Rebecca Dalbigan is responding. There are some similarities here to last year's race. It was a roundabout here some 10 minutes into the race 12 months ago that Oxford finally got a grip 
of that contest, and uh, Oxford are getting at least a greater grip of this one. First signs of weakness in the Cambridge crew. Rebecca there was not as aggressive as her Oxford counterpart. You could see what we heard the Oxford cops call for a big push, and my word, did his crew respond with a massive 20 strokes to take them from half a length down to half a length up. Rebecca needs to get a response out of her crew now, because remember, Cambridge had the inside of this bend for the next minute or a minute and a half, and then the bend's going to be in Oxford's favour. There you see the uh, figures at the bottom of your screen. Oxford on the whole stroking slightly higher. We saw a 37 appear on screen just now. Cambridge around about 34. At the Chiswick steps, you see Oxford 10-18, Cambridge uh, a second just more beyond that. It is a, a quickish race, the record to the Chiswick steps just short of 10 minutes, but Oxford have got it by the throat now. What we saw there was the benefit of being a big, tall, powerful crew. Colin Groshon called for power, and they got themselves out of trouble in a hurry. Cambridge now starting to look a little bit tired. On the other hand, they did not benefit from that clash. The stroke, uh, the seven-man Ryan Monahan missed three or four strokes, and that didn't help them when they were ahead. Into Cordy Reach, who still has it in them? As the coaches would have it, who can snap the handles? Who can move their bit of the boat? Who can stretch the boat? Who can keep it all joined up? Oxford have just about taken a one-length advantage on air now, trying to close the door. They're deliberately steering in front of Cambridge, so Cambridge get dirty water. And don't, uh, don't let Cambridge get the rhythm. The umpire is warning both crews, particularly Oxford, to move over. Yeah, because Cambridge are going to have to move now. If Oxford get warned and Cambridge come back into them, we could see another incident, another clash and potential disqualification. Very few recover from behind at this stage. It requires immense mental strength to keep believing from second place now. It has been done, and done quite recently in the early years of the 21st century. But those guys in the Oxford boat not only have a lead, but they have the advantage of the final bend. And you can just see in their rhythm now, they've got the confidence of being ahead. They were big favourites coming to this race. Cambridge really rattled them, and Oxford started to misfire. Now they can see the opposition, yeah, the lungs are burning, the legs are on fire, but they've got the confidence of being in front and knowing that final bend is in their favour. The boat is running better. Cambridge will have to respond, we have to see that move. Yeah, within the next three, four minutes. And asked about his crew's ferocious regime through the winter, the coach of these men, the coach of Cambridge, Chris Nielsen, said, what would you rather be doing? Imagine the sense of privilege. Be proud to sit in the Cambridge boat and row for your university and row as a part of history. But that privilege is looking frayed round the edges now. Everything is stacked in favour of the favourites, Oxford. Oxford really starting to relax into it. You see Antti Kishurin in the stroke seat there starting to enjoy it, giving his crew a great rhythm to follow. They're only going to extend this lead unless Cambridge really step on the gas. And, of course, the great psychological advantage for the leading crew is that, as painful as every stroke is now, they have the enemy in their sight. They can see it hurting for Cambridge. Whereas uh, Cambridge, as we see them from the umpire's boat, all they can see is water and the likelihood of defeat. You can sense the proximity of the leading boat, but you cannot see the deficit. Only the Cox knows the full truth and the horror of that truth. What we can't underestimate is the amount of energy that these athletes have put in to get this far. OK, Oxford are starting to look relaxed, starting to, to look like they're making it easy, but, yeah, that push in the middle must have really took it out of them. To actually make the boat speed improve that much over such a short period of time, that was a real physical push. Cambridge are going to have to dig deeper and deeper than they've ever dug before to get back from here. But what's happening is Rebecca is trying to come inside Oxford and actually get the inside of the bend around. The final furlong. Only six times in history, only once since the war, has the Barnes Bridge leader failed to win. Roger Bannister in our build-up to the race was quoted as saying, most people don't know what they're capable of. But it would be stretching credulity now to suggest that Rebecca Talbig in there and the Cambridge boat are capable of making up this deficit. For Cambridge, so much investment for so little probable return. 
very, very brave effort by Cambridge. They impressed me in the first half of that race. They really took it to Oxford, really made the, the best of the chances that they had. Rebecca Dalbingham, particularly in the first half of the race, was dominating. She was able to give her crew an advantage and her crew were able to respond. But to me, that crucial push in the middle, when Oxford went for it, they had the power, they had the ability just to, to jump from behind to in front. And now looking at them, they look confident, they look relaxed and they're looking good. And for the second year running, Wayne, because it is very similar to what we saw 12 months ago, the second year running, Cambridge have made a race of it to halfway and beyond, but haven't been strong enough to hold on. They made a fanta fantastic effort of it, just like last year. They threw all their cards on the table, they very nearly got a length clear, which is what they needed to do, but Oxford were too strong when the crucial moment came. And so, at Oxford, success continues to breed success. They have the knack. Their coach, Sean Bowden, calm and clever and contained, has honed the system, which is now repeatedly proven. And Cambridge have some catching up to do, some 21st century catching up to do. Yeah, it shows the success of the Oxford system that Sean Bowden has, has produced. He's producing winners, he's producing crews, that when it's in the fight, they know how to fight. Got Koviak and Smith, the two big Americans, Tom Salisbury, from London, and there is Kishorin, who lost two years ago and has come back to stroke a winning boat. Oxford have the knack, they have the personnel, far-flung athletes harvested from all corners of the globe and taught the Oxford way, the winning way, multinational Oxford, six countries in one boat, unified by the language of sport and the common desire to succeed. They know, they just know, there is a certainty about their approach. The first decade of the 21st century is shaded ineradicably dark blue. It is Oxford again. Oxford 2009. Pedigree and power have won the day. Five Olympians have had their way. And so has anyone whose heart beats for OUBC. Cambridge follow them gamely home having given as much as they possibly could have given. But for the distinguished Oxford president, Colin Smith, another prize to set alongside his Olympic silver medal. His boat race wins now eclipse his single defeat. For the men at the extremes of the boat, Plotkoviak and Kishore in extremes of emotion, beaten two years ago, returning now as winners. For the big beast from Wellington, George Bridgewater there smiling, a, a splendid accompaniment to his Olympic bronze. The two Americans, Hearn and Harrison, have plenty to write home about, as does their countryman Cox, Colin Groshong, for whom this is a triumph against adversity. A boat race campaign that almost didn't begin has ended in a win. Joy in the engine room for the big Dutchman, Short Hamburger, and Britain's Tom Salisbury, the Crystal Palace fan, is glad all over. For Port Cambridge, the deficit in height and weight and experience and savvy was just too much to make up. Illness and injury have frequently thrown a spanner in their work since Christmas. Reasons, not excuses, none of them ultimately relevant, because in the end they simply lost Cambridge to a better crew. And for four of the Cambridge boys, it's all they've ever known. For four more, played two, lost two. Only Rebecca Dalbiggin has ever experienced the uplift of victory that those Oxford boys are enjoying now. Cambridge 79, Oxford now 75, the gap between them down to four, as small a gap as it's been for 14 years. Cambridge, as ever, were stylish, but Oxford were substantial. And in the end, chaps, just briefly, it's what we had expected. It is, it's the favourites, because I've showed us why they were favourites in the end. Impressive, very impressive performance from Cambridge to actually put them under pressure, but Oxford, when it really counted, yeah, they have the armoury, they have the weapons. It's another great win for Sean Bowden, the Oxford coach, and a cruel initiation for Chris Nielsen, who's just taken over at Cambridge, but he'll learn from this and he'll be back soon.